Hey, good morning, Redeemer Church. So now I feel much better because it was my dad who was shaking and not me. As I was standing here like, who's shaking? <laughs> so just before I start the service, I just want to thank Phil and the elders for giving me the opportunity to preach this morning. And thank you for, to Phil who has been mentoring me through the past few months that I've lived in Mauritius. I'm studying theology and this is my first time preaching, so have a little grace. <laughs> um, so this morning, I want to start off my message with an interesting bit of trivia. So the average American spends one year of their life looking for lost things. One entire year. And now, I'm pretty sure most of you have lost things in your life, whether it's your keys, your wallet, your glasses, and all of these things are extremely important. Because without your glasses, you probably can't see that well. Without your keys, you can't drive your car. And without your wallet, you don't have, I don't know, your bank card or your license. But essentially, every time you find these things, you think, oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. But I mean, it's not that big of a deal if it really gets lost. I mean, okay. So, on Wednesday morning, I was driving, and I really wanted a packet of jelly tots. And so, London Way hasn't had jelly tots for like the past four weeks, but I decided to stop there anyway, just for in case. And I got there, and I realized that I don't have a bank card with me, but I do have coins. So now, imagine sitting there, counting your coins, and you think, I just need to make sure I have enough because if I get at the checkout and I don't have enough, that will be pretty embarrassing because I'm just buying jelly tots. And so I'm sitting there and I'm counting them and I have enough. And for no apparent reason, one of them falls as I get out of the car. Now I don't know where my coin is. So goodbye, jelly tots. But no, I get out, open the back door, and I start looking for my coin. So I'm there under the seat, and I almost need to put on my flashlight to see, and I don't find it. But I decide, no. I go around. And I open the door again, and there's a baby car seat in the back. So it's, so it's quite an obstacle to get underneath the seat, but I do it anyway. And I put on my flashlight because I'm determined to find this coin. And I take out the whole carpet, and eventually I find my coin, and I think, yes, now I can buy my packet of jelly tots. But usually, when something good happens, I always call Carmen. But this time, I didn't, because it's just a coin. I mean, it's just a coin, and it's just a packet of jelly tots. And so, um, in Luke chapter 15... The whole chapter is devoted to parables of lost things. And this morning, I want to focus on two of these parables. Now, the first parable we find a woman who has 10 silver coins. And she loses one of them. Only one. One coin. And we see in verse 8 that Jesus asked, Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she does, she calls her friends and neighbors together, and she says, Rejoice with me, because I found my lost coin. So Jesus paints this picture of a woman who goes to extreme measures and does everything in her power to find this lost coin. And when she does, she calls her neighbors and says, Come over and come rejoice with me. Now, the second parable is quite similar to the first one. But this time, we find a shepherd who has 99 sheep, and he loses one. Not 50 sheep, not 66 sheep, not 99 sheep. He loses one. And guess what he does? He leaves 99 sheep, 99, guys, he leaves 99 to go and look for one. And so Luke 15 verse 5 says, When he finds the sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbor together and he says, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. And right about now, 
we're all thinking these people did not only lose one coin and one sheep, they clearly lost their marbles because these people are nuts for going out and finding one sheep and one coin and then calling their neighbors. Like, can you picture this? It's a hectic day at work. You're sitting there and everyone is on your case and you're working and you get a phone call from your neighbor and he says, let's say the neighbor's name is Ben and Ben says, listen, come home. It's urgent. Please, please just come home. Don't ask questions. Please just come home. Come home. And now you're stressing, you know, your heart is pounding and you pack up your laptop and you rush to your car and you drive like a maniac because you need to get home because what if something happened to your wife or your kids or your dog or your goldfish and you're freaking out and you get there and you stand in front of his gate and you open the gate and you go in and you say, Ben, I'm here, I'm here. What's wrong? What's wrong? And he says, nothing is wrong. You're thinking, then why did you call me? And he says, because you remember, like three days ago, I lost my coin, and I found it! And I called you to come over and rejoice with me. Like, I got party hats and cake and everything. Like, we are going to rejoice because I found my lost coin. Okay, so now, in these parables, Jesus illustrates the love of the Father for the lost. And he explains to what extreme measures God would go to to find his lost people. And so the New Testament is filled with multiple occasions of God going out and pursuing the lost. But this morning, I want to focus on one particular man called Saul. Now, Saul is a Jew, and he is extremely serious about his faith. So serious that he became a persecutor of Christians. Saul goes out, makes his life mission to go out and persecute Christians. Acts 9 verse 1 says that Saul breathed murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now, can you picture a very determined soul on his way to Damascus with letters from the synagogues saying that if you get there and you find anyone who belongs to the Lord, you can take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Anyone. So now, Saul is on his way to Damascus, and in verse 3 it says, As he nears Damascus on his journey, a bright light from heaven flashes around him. He fell to the ground and heard the voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And he replies, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. And then Jesus says, go Get up, go to the city, and you will be told what to do. Now Saul is completely blind because of his encounter with Jesus, and he gets up, and the people who are on this journey to Damascus with him need to lead him to the city. And so while they are leading him, God appears to Ananias in a vision, and he says to him, Ananias, Um, Go to the house of Judas and meet a man called Saul from Tarsus and restore his sight. Now this time, imagine you're Ananias. You know this guy, Saul. You know he's a persecutor. You know if he's on his way to Damascus, big trouble is coming. And you won't say it out loud, but you're a bit afraid of this guy. So you're not really keen to go to Judas' house at all. And yet, Ananias is obedient, and he goes to the house of Judas to restore Saul's sight. And Judas, and don't do this, Ananias is at Judas' house, and Saul gets there, and he restores his sight, and something like scales falls from the eyes of Saul. And Saul is baptized 
then and there, and he is filled with the Holy Spirit. How crazy. But Saul's story doesn't end at his conviction and his invitation that God extends to him. God calls him to be a chosen instrument to go and proclaim the gospel. Luke 15 verse 27 says, He then went out and preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. The thing is, God knew exactly who Saul was. He knew he was a persecutor of Christians. And the most beautiful part of this story is God standing in front of Saul and he's knocking on his door and he says, open this door to me. Let me come in. He doesn't barge in there. God is a gentleman. He stands and waits for Saul to accept this invitation. And when Saul does, his name changes to Paul, and God calls him to go out and make disciples. Now, both the story of Saul and the two parables sound extremely ridiculous. It does. Thank you for laughing, because it does. Like, imagine... Like, you are God, and you are going out. There's Saul. He's a persecutor. You don't wipe him off the face of the planet. You go to him, and you change his life. You pick this guy to go out and make disciples. But it sounds ridiculous until you realize that you are that lost coin. You are that lost sheep. You are Saul, and the God of the universe comes and he pursues you, and he goes to extreme measures to find you. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God sends down his only son to die on a cross for you. God seeks you and he chases you down until he finds you. Louis Giglio writes, God is always seeking you. Every sunset, every clear blue sky, every ocean wave, and he blankets each day with an invitation, I am here. And God is extending this invite to you. And he says, come, I want to be in a relationship with you. Not anyone else, you. I'm picking you. I'm running after you. But just like Saul's story our story doesn't end at us accepting Jesus' invite. God calls each and every one of us to be his instrument, to go out and to pursue the lost. In Matthew 28, verse 16, it says, After Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead, the disciples go up to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then, after you've done that, Go out and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. This great commission was not only meant for the disciples. God didn't pick this 12 men and say, okay, only you, no one else. Each of us are called to go out and to proclaim the gospel to the lost. 
God is calling us to be His hands and feet. God is calling us to be laborers who are willing to go out into His harvest and to reach the lost for His kingdom. God is calling us. Let me tell you something. These people around you, they aren't unvalued coins. And losing them isn't fine. God is saying, these people, I love them. I'm pursuing them. I'm knocking at their door. And I want to use you to reach them. Both of the parables end like this. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One lost soul. Only one lost soul. And the whole of heaven rejoices. The whole of heaven rejoices because we were willing to go out and tell people, this is my Jesus. And this is what he came to do for me. This is what he came to do for you. And you, Oliane, it's difficult. It's difficult. Like, I think you should rather do it. Or send Phil, send Sid. They're there already. But reaching the lost is as simple as reflecting who Jesus is. Psalm 145, verse 8 to 9 says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. So let's be gracious. Let's be compassionate. Let's be slow to anger and rich in love to the people around us. Not only some, but to everyone around us so that they can see through you who Jesus is. You know, reaching the lost means to simply put in effort. Going out and reaching them. You know, the lost are called lost for a reason. They don't know where to go. You are supposed to be going out and telling them, this is where you ought to be. This is the place. This church is where you can find Jesus. The next thing, reaching the lost is as simple as having persistence. You know, sometimes it takes months or years for these people to come to Christ. But God is asking you to be persistent. To keep on asking, keep on inviting them to church, keep on telling them, this is my Jesus. If coins and sheep are valued enough for a persistent search, how much more valuable are God's people? Sheep and coins, I'm going to say it again, they are Enough of value for a persistent search. A persistent search. Now, reaching the lost is literally as easy as loving your neighbor and inviting him to church. That is how easy it is. Back in South Africa, I have a friend and... You know, we're very close friends, so he tells me everything, and, you know, he tells me all of the dumb things he does and the mistakes that he makes, and, you know, I know that since I've known him, God is constantly pursuing him, constantly, and God has been knocking on his door, and he finally opened his door, and he says, come in, Jesus, I'm accepting you into my heart. In this week, I got a message from one of my other friends who's in the same church as this guy. And he tells me, hey, Leonay, like, I made friends with this guy. 
And I'm thinking, what? And he says, yes, suddenly we're friends. I don't know what happened. And he says, this guy invites me over to his house and we read Bible together. And I'm thinking, what? And he says, we're sitting there and we're praying for each other. And whenever we're around other people, he says, do you know what? I'm not doing that with you because I gave my heart to the Lord. And he says, you know what? You know how I don't really go to church on Sundays. Like church isn't really my thing. Well, this guy kept inviting me to church. And I suddenly, I find myself going to church every Sunday and I even signed up for kids ministry. I'm thinking, wow, God has pursued one of my friends, and through him, God is pursuing his friends. God is working through this guy to make disciples. And I don't even think he realizes it. This 21-year-old guy is being the hands and feet of, of Jesus in his everyday life. You know, at this morning, God is pursuing you. The God who sent down his son to die on a cross is inviting you to be in a relationship with him. He's standing here and he's knocking at your door and he's saying, open the door. I'm not going to force myself in. There's a handle on the inside and you're the one who's supposed to be opening this door for me. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've turned away from God completely or if you've gone astray for a little bit. God is saying, you, I pick you. I want you to be in heaven with me one day. I want you to have eternal life. Can you imagine sending down your only son to die for people you know won't even pick you? They might not even pick you. That is how much God loves you. And then this morning, if you're the second group of people, You know, you've already accepted God and you love Him and you're in a relationship with Him. And God is calling you to go out and reach the lost. I'm not saying go to the ends of the earth. I'm saying invite your neighbor to church. And once again, you might be thinking, well, you know, I'm not qualified enough. God is not asking you to be qualified. He's asking you to be his hands and feet. He's asking you this morning to say, I am willing to go out into your harvest and to be a laborer for your kingdom. I'm willing to reach the last person who sits next to me every day at work. I'm willing to go out and to reach that family member that I know hasn't chosen you yet. Here I am, Lord. I'm willing to go. So I want you to all stand up for me, please. This morning is your chance to respond to God while you're standing in the seat. Not, I'll think about it when I go home. Right now, you have an opportunity right now to say, God, I accept who you are. I accept what you've done on the cross for me. I accept you into my life. No matter what has happened before, I know that you are a good God and a faithful God. And you've come for me. 
And if you're the second group of people, this is your opportunity to respond and to say, yes, Lord, here I am. Send me. And I'm going to give you a few minutes just to pray to God and just to say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Lord, this morning I just want to come to you, Lord. I just want to thank you for each and every person that is standing in front of me today, Lord. Lord, thank you that I know that you have died on a cross for each and every one of them. Lord, thank you that you are knocking on our doors. Lord, no matter who we are, you are inviting us to be in a love relationship with you and Lord, this morning we accept your invitation. Lord, thank you for who you are, Lord. And Lord, this morning we want to say that we are willing to go out, Lord. Lord, we are willing to reach the lost, Lord. Lord, we are willing to tell that one person who sits next to us every day that this is my God, and this is what he came to do for me. Lord, we want to be your hands and feet, Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we can stand in front of you to morning, this morning, Lord. Thank you that we can say, Lord, we are your children, and we want to be laborers in your harvest. And Lord, I pray that this morning, if... If someone here says, not yet, Lord, I don't know, Lord, I'm confused, I don't know who you are, or what you've done, Lord, I'm not ready yet. Lord, I pray that you would keep on pursuing them, that you would keep knocking at their doors, that you would say, this is who I am and this is what I did, and I will keep knocking and keep waiting, and keep chasing, and seeking you. Thank you, Lord, that we know that you are a good God, Lord. And thank you that we can trust you in our lives, and thank you that we can trust that you are pursuing these people. And thank you that you're picking us to go out and be your hands and feet. I prayed in your name. Amen.